Hey, everybody. Welcome to Dixie Cryptid. I told you I was real busy at work, uh, probably going to be for the next month or so. But I just uh, hit a deadline. Matter of fact, I was five days early on it. About to jump into another sequence on this project and try to beat that deadline. But between sequences, I thought I would go ahead and pump out a Best of Dixie Cryptid Volume 2. This is two hours of previous stories that I've released without me rambling at the end of the story. I'm not, I don't add any of my commentary. You just get to listen to the story. And I hope you guys enjoy this. Also, several people have asked what I do for a living. I talk about my job, but I don't really give many details. I'm in the, I'm not an engineer. I'm an engineering technician. I'm not a uh, professional. I'm not a professional. Uh, and I'm not, I don't have a college education. I don't, uh, I just don't have those credentials. However, I've learned uh, just with hands-on stuff for the last 35 years how to do this stuff. And uh, that's what I do for a living. So what I thought I would do is screen record a couple of little jobs that I've done. And so what you're going to see in this video is me actually working. This is what I do all day long. So that people who kind of wonder what I do, you'll get to see what I do all day. And you'll see it takes a lot of concentration I can't, it's hard for me to do two things at one time. But anyway, that's that. It's probably pretty boring to you, but you know, I got to put something in the video section of these YouTube things. So maybe you'll get a, I don't know, maybe an idea of what I do. And then when those videos run out, I'm just going to run this thumbnail through the end of the video because it really doesn't matter. What really matters is the story. So I hope you guys enjoy this and I'll, I'll uh, probably next week I'll get another best of out. And uh, you guys have a great week. I'm working hard 12 hours a day, seven days a week, trying to get done with this so I can get back to doing fun stuff like YouTube. Thank you very much. You're so nice to be patient with me. Let's get rolling with Best of Dixie Cryptid Volume 2. All right, here we go. My name is Cameron Buckner, and this is the What If It's True podcast. The following podcast is volume two of the best of Dixie Cryptid. This is a combination of podcasts previously uploaded to YouTube. Hope you enjoy it. One summer morning a few years back, two friends, Dan and Josiah, went hiking deep into a canyon just outside of town. Their plan was to build a large teepee-like structure using fallen timber. It would be a gift to the area's Sasquatch people. They arrived at their destination about three miles out of town and paused to look around. By the looks of things, they'd probably need to venture a bit farther up the mountain and deeper into the woods for enough material for the structure. They blazed a trail as they made their way, adding another quarter to half a mile to the trek before they came upon a fairly level clearing with a tree stump near the middle of it. It was the perfect location for their gift. They split up and started collecting skinny 10 to 15 foot tall timber to erect into the structure around the tree stump. The stump would act as a table within the teepee. The door or the opening was about five or six feet tall. Once the structure was in place and standing on its own, they filled the gaps with smaller sticks and branches and leaves to help keep the rain out. When they were done, they left a granola bar on the stump and headed back down the mountain. After they arrived at their car, they packed up and began their slow drive back out of the canyon. Just when they were about to make the bend in the road, something moving up on the ridge caught their attention, and it was the ridge that they were just on. 
There, running on the ridge, was a reddish-brown-haired Sasquatch, quickly making its way down the mountain towards them. When the creature reached the edge of the hill and saw the car, it stopped and just looked at them. As they looked back at it, and as if it realized they'd seen it, it morphed into a tree, blending into the rest of the hillside. One second it was standing there, and the next instant it was a small pine tree. Was it a sort of defense mechanism or camouflage technique? Was it something they used to remain unseen from prey and humans? It really didn't matter at that point, as they'd already seen it. It would be a while before Dan went camping in that canyon. Everything seemed normal until one morning he awoke to find a small blue marble laying next to his sleeping bag. The marble had a piece of reddish-brown hair embedded inside. What did this mean? Was it a gift from a Sasquatch? Months later, Dan decided to venture out alone for an evening hike up another forest service road and then head off the trail to find a remote camping spot. As the crow flies, the location of this trip's campsite would be no more than four miles from the clearing him and Josiah had built that teepee. He didn't have to venture off the trail for too long before coming upon a nice level spot perfect for his two-person tent. He was surrounded by tall trees, which served to block out any noise from town, which was less than a mile below. It wasn't long before camp was made and his dinner was gone. For good measure, he backtracked through the woods to find a tree branch to hang a small bag of garbage. That would hopefully keep any nosy bears distracted and away from his tent as he slept. Before turning in for the night, he pulled a canister of bear spray out of his pack and grabbed a book for some light reading. Nearly an hour later, he rolled over and turned out the light and went to bed. Sometime during the early morning hours, he was jolted awake by a deep rumbling feeling coming from the ground and the sound of a bulldozer crashing through the trees. It sounded like it was about 50 yards away and coming towards his campsite. The rumbling wasn't like an earthquake, but more like a stampede of horses or cattle running right at him. But how could that be? He was nestled deep in the woods and far away from the road. And he wondered, were there free-range cattle in the area? And were they possibly spooked or attacked, causing them to run away from a predator and unknowingly towards him? As the approaching violence got closer and closer, his sleepy brain was simply overcome by the trembling ground and loud crashing sound of the large trees right outside his tent. As he clenched his bear spray, he closed his eyes and he braced for an impact. And then everything stopped. Everything suddenly went quiet and peaceful. He opened his eyes and focused his hearing as he could sense something at the edge of the campsite to the left of his tent. There was no way he was going to look outside, so he continued to listen for any clue to what was out there. It took less than a minute for whatever was outside to turn around and slowly walk away in the direction in which it had come. Dan lay in his sleeping bag holding his breath. He could feel the heavy thuds from its feet as whatever it was walked away on two legs. Needless to say, Dan didn't go back to bed. He couldn't sleep. He laid helpless in his mind, replaying every second of the event over and over again, trying to make sense of what had just happened. Come morning, he cautiously unzipped his tent and slowly and quietly climbed out. With every inch, he paused all body movement and held his breath to scan the left and to the right before climbing out. He was pretty shook up. Whatever it was, it was gone. There was no visible destruction within the campsite, and even more alarming, the trail back to the road was clear of any sign of violence he'd both heard and felt. Even the garbage bag was still tied above from the branch. Dan gave a lot of thought to what happened before telling me about that wild night. Whatever it was, once it found me asleep with the campfire put out properly, it turned around and it let me be, he said. I hadn't been making a lot of noise and my fire had been small, so I'm not sure how it knew where I was. Dan wasn't the only one to have follow-up experiences. 
During a solo hike, Josiah found himself about a mile or more outside of town on the opposite side of town from where him and Dan had built that teepee. It was early evening when he set out. As he hiked parallel to a river, he eventually came upon a batch of similar teepee tree structures. They had been created by Boy Scouts and varied in sizes and distance from the trail. Hikers and campers used them as shelters. After he passed the first structure, he suddenly felt like something was circling him. It was such a strong feeling it made him pause to look around to see if he could see anyone or anything nearby. That's when he felt the need to look down. There in front of his feet was an arrowhead, but it wasn't a normal arrowhead. Josiah is part Native American and has seen a lot of arrowheads and knows how to make them. This one was different. Whereas they're usually created using a chipping or flaking method known as flint napping, this one seemed more like it was rubbed into shape. By this time it was getting dark so he hiked up to one of the teepees and climbed inside to rest and examine the arrowhead. While inside, he heard small stones being tossed at the teepee. He leaned over and stuck his head outside, but he didn't see anyone. The sound of stones hitting the structure continued, so he decided to take the hint and move along. Obviously, someone didn't want him there. That's when things got a bit more strange. As he retreated back down the slope towards the trail, the stones continued to land all around him. At the trail, and after stopping to look for the culprit once more, a large piece of tree bark suddenly manifested from thin air right in front of him. He said it wasn't there, and then it was. He watched as it hovered in front of his face briefly and then fell to the ground. It was as if someone dangled it in front of him for a moment and then simply let it fall to the ground. This freaked him out, so rather than continue up the trail, he decided to quickly backtrack towards town. A ways down the trail, he realized he dropped the cap to his camera. Reluctantly, he turned back up the trail and used his flashlight to scan the ground ahead of him. Just as he spotted it and bent over to pick it up, someone threw something very large and heavy in his direction. When it made an impact with the ground, he literally jumped and yelled, I'm just coming back for this. Josiah then hastily made his way back into town and to his cabin. That was the last time he's hiked that area alone. The following accounts come from the husband of someone who I work with. She knows about people sharing their stories with me, so she asked if I'd like to meet her husband. What follows is an example of his strange and unexpected encounters while hunting. During the second week of October, my brother-in-law arrived at our hunting location just after 5 a.m. It was still dark out, and I like to get out and just settle in to allow my eyes to adjust to the darkness before I head out. As I slowly made my way past empty homestead horse corrals, I was looking for an opening or clearing to just stop, look, and listen. That's when I first smelled it. The odor reeked so bad it was worse than any bear or mountain lion that I've ever smelled. And that's when I felt like I was being watched. I slowly turned around and suddenly all the hair on my body stood up. That caused me to chamber around in my rifle, and I also unsnapped my holster so I could pull out my pistol in case I needed it. Ten to fifteen yards ahead of me, I heard a tremendous roar that was so loud it shook my entire body. The timber was dark, and it was still dark out, so all I saw appear to be a large dark shadow. I could see it standing upright and moving just near the tree line. As I turned to look at it, it was looking at me. By this point, it was less than 25 feet away. As I knelt down to take aim at it, I couldn't find it in the scope. It was too dark. While on my knees, I popped one of my 300 wind mag rounds out of the magazine and onto the ground so I could retrace my tracks when it was light out. 
That's when the creature started moving down through the bush and trees towards the creek. When it took the first step, it was long and a deliberate step in a direction away from me. I could feel the ground shake when it took that step. I quickly retreated the three to 400 yards back to my truck where I found my brother-in-law still inside. He was holding his pistol up and close to his chest. I tried to open the door, but it was locked. Open the door, I told him, but he shook his head and he said, no way. He heard it too and grabbed his gun. He said it made the hair on his body stand straight up just like me. We remained in the truck talking until the sun started to come up and we could see better. It took some doing, but I convinced him to come with me to where I saw this creature. After we reached the spot, I located that 300 wind mag round and showed it to him. This is where it happened and I pointed to a tree where it was. Now that it is light out, I could also gauge how tall it was standing beside the tree. I'm thinking it was nine feet tall, I told my trembling brother-in-law. We could also see and follow its tracks in the grass, as it was so heavy it packed the grass down pretty good. So we followed the tracks along the road for a ways before I noticed that it curiously never stepped onto the road. It always walked alongside in the grass all the way down to the creek, where the ground turned to a really hard clay-like black dirt. You could tell it was really heavy when we could see the prints in that hard soil. That was an awful feeling. The creature's tracks continued across the creek and up into the dark timber on the other side of the meadow, and that's as far as we dared go. As strange as it sounds, we continued hunting the rest of the day, but didn't get anything. The next day, however, I had to remind my brother that we loved hunting for bull elk, and we could even see the elk about 400 yards to the east. He agreed with me, so we spent the day tracking elk, only to see cows, no bulls. While we were stalking the herd of elk, I told my brother that on the way back we could keep looking for sign from that creature, but he really didn't want to. He was still scared from that roar. The man continued the story that the following weekend, another hunter he knows well went hunting in the same area. In fact, the man's father-in-law owns the ranch we've all been hunting on where these stories took place. I didn't tell him anything about what happened the week before. This guy came back after the first day all scared, saying something was out there roaring and yelling at him. It evidently scared him so bad he said he's never going to hunt again. At this point, I interjected with the story of the team of the men who were cutting fuel wood and left everything up the mountain as they fled back down the mountain. That would have been in your marathon number 96. He said that location where it happened and where he's been hunting were only three miles apart as the crow flies. He proceeded to tell me about another incident where he was scouting in an area not far from where the Sasquatch scared him and his brother-in-law. And here's what he said. While hiking in an area where these are remnants of old gold mines from the late to mid-1800s, I noticed a deer stuck up in a tree. Its head was stuck in a wedge and its hindquarters were shredded apart. I looked for any sign of a mountain lion, but I couldn't see any tracks, drag marks, or even claw marks the cat would leave struggling to get the deer up the tree. Nothing. So how did the deer get up the nearly 15 foot end of the tree, and what animal shredded it up? It was not picked at, it was shredded. On another trip, a friend and I stumbled upon a large teepee structure made out of large trees. The two of us tried moving the smallest of the trees, but we couldn't budge it. Then, in a more heavily wooded area, we found one twice its size. It would take a helicopter or heavy equipment to build such a thing. The trees were that big. He added that he has several friends who are veterinarians and taxidermists, and they want to go out with him to see what they can find, as he finds some really strange stuff. He went on to say, for example, during one trip, one of my friends discovered some strange hair. We had it tested, but the results came back unknown. I told him about Josiah's hike where he had the stones thrown at him while he sat inside the teepee. 
He knew that area well and continued with a couple of more experiences from the same area that Josiah hiked. He went on to say, while turkey hunting with my cousin, I told him that something big below us was making a lot of noise, but I couldn't see what it was. Together, we decided to pack it up and venture down the mountain to where the loud thudding and grunting noises were coming from. After adjusting in his chair, he continued, Near the creek where the water had previously been high enough for the spring to run off to flood out a bit and then recede, I found a large log that had recently been stepped on. When I saw it, I knew one of the noises I heard from up the hill was from something very large and heavy stepping on it. I heard it snap, not crack like a smaller branch would make, but a loud, dull, popping or crushing sound. I could tell it came from a thick log that was snapped, and here it was. Part of it was stuck really deep into the ground. Something very heavy must have stepped on it, and it had to be heavier than a bear, and that's all I can say about it. Again, I interjected, going back to the man who, after being yelled at by one of these creatures, said he was going to quit hunting. I asked how many people he knows who have gone hunting in that area and had something frightening happen to them. He answered, I know five to six men who were scared so bad they've quit deer and elk hunting altogether. At this point, I'd like to remind you and your audience that this ranch is easily within two to three miles from the location where the man cutting firewood had a rock land between him and his team. It's also within two to three miles from where Dan and Josiah saw the Sasquatch running along the ridge line after them, as well as where Little Yeti's family cabin is. In fact, all of the stories I've shared with you thus far have been within a 10-mile radius of each other. The uh, Little Yeti story is coming up next, so <laughs> you don't know what that is, but you're about to. Also remember, in your Marathon 96, Billy, the boy who had sticks thrown at him before hearing kids giggling, then his dad put a can of Dr. Pepper outside only to have it disappear. Well, that family had several more encounters, including his wife, Tammy, having multiple close encounters with the large silver-haired male Sasquatch and even UFO sightings. I'll be sending more of those soon. Imagine dining in a restaurant and overhearing someone's waitress say to their table, My nickname since I was a little girl has been Little Yeti. Her table had apparently been talking Bigfoot when she walked by. Wait, what? One of her customers asked as she was headed down the drink station. Their waitress turned back at them and smiled. I'll be right back. After a few minutes of which probably seemed like an eternity to those people, Little Yeti returned to their table. What did you mean? asked one of the men at the table. Have you ever seen a Bigfoot around here? I sure have, she said many times. In part, that's how I got my nickname. I've sort of grown up with them. The three people at the table just looked at each other with puzzled looks on their faces. She continued, one morning when I was younger, I looked out the window of our family cabin as my uncle was outside playing with his two dogs. It was about then that he noticed they were nowhere in sight. After repeatedly calling their names and also looking behind the cabin, he spotted them cowering under his pickup truck in the driveway. He called to them, but they wouldn't even look at him. What's going on? He wondered out loud. And then he noticed the direction they were looking was to the trees less than 50 yards directly behind him. At this point, everyone at my table continued to eavesdrop on the conversation as their waitress paused for a moment and just looked at each other for her customers. Everyone at my table continued to eavesdrop on this conversation as their waitress paused for a moment and just looked at each of her customers. The man in a green hat asked, Okay, what happened next? Well, before my uncle even turned around, the hair on his neck stood straight up. He was almost too afraid to turn around. As he slowly gazed down at the dogs again to see if they were still looking behind him, he slowly reached inside the truck and grabbed a Savage 30 alt 6 hunting rifle. 
Once more, he checked with the dogs before he finally began to turn around. Little Yeti stopped her story to add that the woods around their family cabin has a long history of visitations from coyotes, black bear, elk, mule deer, bobcat, mountain lion, and if you believe some people, wolves and grizzly bear. Whatever was behind her uncle was scary enough to spook those dogs. Little Yeti continued, My uncle cautiously swiveled his upper body towards the woods, holding the gun close to his chest. And then he saw it. Just outside of the tree stood a seven to eight foot hairy man watching him and his dogs. He was covered in brown hair and he stood motionless. I watched through the window as my uncle slowly lifted the rifle to his shoulder so he could look at this man through a high-powered scope. Just as he put his eye to the scope, the creature turned and ran into the woods. Wow, said one of the men at the table. Yeah, it took a couple of minutes before his dogs felt safe enough to leave the shelter of the truck. Okay, can I get you folks anything else? Each of the three men at the table looked at each other and then one asked, So why is your nickname Little Yeti? Oh yeah, that's another story. Well, sort of, she said. They all laughed and chimed in together. Well, we're not going anywhere, so carry on. Okay, but let me check on my other tables first. Are you sure you don't need anything else while I'm here? We're sure. How about another round of that delicious root beer? And she replied, coming right up. While she was away, the three of them just sort of looked off out the windows, probably imagining what it could have been like to experience a Sasquatch up in those mountains, especially when your two dogs are apparently unable to confront it. Seriously, many people go hiking with their dogs, hoping it will protect them. Maybe they would, but against a close encounter with a Sasquatch? My friends and I looked at each other, and we smiled. Yeah, we're not going anywhere either. This is too good. It wasn't long before their waitress returned with three large root beers. And Little Yeti said, okay, so where were we? One of the men said, we're wondering where you got your nickname. Laughing, she said, oh yeah, that. The encounter I just told you wasn't my first time seeing one of these creatures while growing up at my parents' cabin. In fact, I've seen that particular Sasquatch many times before, so I'm not afraid of him. My uncle, though, that was his first time. He'd heard some of my stories over the years, but never had a personal experience before that. He didn't want to shoot it, just get a closer look. This will probably sound a bit unusual and maybe unbelievable, but when I was seven years old, my parents and I were sitting in the living room of the cabin with the windows and the front door open. It was about the same time of year as now, so having the windows and door open allowed cool air to circulate through the house. Suddenly, my mother said, listen, do you hear that? And we all stopped moving and tuned our ears towards the outdoors. There, that, did you guys hear it? We all jumped up and we ran outside to get a better listen. And my dad said, that sounds like an elk calf calling out to its mother. And we all looked at each other and began moving towards the sound. It didn't seem that far away, possibly just inside the trees where my uncle saw the hairy man. When we arrived to where we thought the sound was coming from, my mother said, it now sounds like it's over there, pointing to our left another 30 or 40 yards away. Once more, we stopped where we thought the sound was coming from, but we didn't see anything. There it is again, my mother said as she pointed back in another direction. What is going on, my father said. It's like moving us around, but we can't see it. And this continued for quite a while, and before we knew it, we were quite a distance from the cabin. And then we heard the crying sound coming from the edge of a cliff. That cliff was nearly a mile from the cabin. And my mother said, I don't get it. Where is this baby elk? My father walked to the ledge, and he looked down. What the heck, he blurted out. Come look at this. My mother and I ran over to the edge of the cliff and looked down to see what he had seen. There, on a small ledge, was an elk calf. Somehow it became trapped about 25 feet down on a really small outcropping. And then my dad asked, okay, how would this elk get all the way down there without going over the edge? 
He didn't wait for an answer. I'll be right back. I'm going for a rope. You two stay here and keep an eye on it. My father disappeared back into the woods. Our cabin was now a mile away, so it would take a while before he returned. My mother and I sat down on a fallen tree and just looked down at the baby. Mom, how do you get down there and how could we hear it all the way through the woods to our house? Well, I don't know, honey. It didn't take my father as long to return as I thought it would. He appeared on the ranger with ropes in the back. He said, you'll never guess what I found on the way to the cabin. The baby's mother is dead and her carcass has already been chewed on by coyotes. She's not far from here, just over that way. Dad tied a rope up to his harness into a nearby tree and then lowered himself down to the elk. My mom and I stood above him and asked, can we do anything to help? I'm going to lift the elk above my shoulders and try to climb back up. I need you guys to keep the rope to the side of the tree root so it doesn't get hung up, okay? Can you do that? Sure, honey, my mother replied. It took my dad about five minutes to get the baby up to safety. He was exhausted and sat down to catch his breath. The three of us just sat there looking at the calf. It was probably relieved too, but it didn't run off. It just laid down in the shade of my father. The waitress stopped there and she looked at her watch and said she'd be back for the rest of the story. One of her orders had appeared to be up, so she needed to take someone's food to the table. While she was gone, one of the customers said, poor baby. Yeah, I wonder how this story ends, said another guy. It was about 15 minutes before she returned to finish the story. Okay, we have to hurry with the rest of the story. I have more tables coming in, she said. We all piled into our UTV and took the baby elk back to the cabin. I was the lucky one who got to hold it during the ride. My dad slowed the UTV down at one point and pointed up ahead. That's the mother carcass right there. My mother then suggested that maybe the baby ran for safety, but ended up trapped over the edge. Maybe, said my dad, but there's no way it should have landed on that small outcropping and not fallen into the ravine below. Dad, do you know how we could hear it crying from way out there, I asked. I sure don't. A lot of this doesn't make any sense at all. He continued, for now, we need to figure out what to do with this elk. We all remained silent the rest of the way back to the cabin. Bring the elk inside with you, my dad said, as he took the machine out back and he parked it. And then little Yeti said, okay guys, to make a longer story shorter, the elk stayed with us until it was older, much older. In fact, it was too large to stay indoors. Can you imagine a long-legged elk walking around inside your house? One thing became clear over time. The more and more we talked about the details of what happened, the more the only thing that really made sense didn't make any sense at all. The cow elk was killed and the baby needed shelter. There's absolutely no way we would have heard its cries for help at that distance. We even tested it by yelling and playing loud music from the ranger. We couldn't hear anything from that far out, even at night. So what are you saying? One of the guys at the table asked. I'm suggesting that the brown-haired Sasquatch helped us find the baby. We also found his large footprints near the ledge when we went back to test sound traveling back to our cabin. That one Bigfoot came around a few years following our return with the calf. It was as if he was checking to make sure that we had it home safely. Additionally, there's no realistic way the baby would have survived the fall 25 feet down to the tiny landing in which we found it on. We think that Sasquatch was mimicking the baby's cries to get our attention, and from a distance we could hear it. Then it lured us closer and closer to the ledge where we believe it placed the baby, so no predators could get at it. The waitress stopped for a breather and let it sink in with her customers, who just stared at her. Wow, that's an amazing story. But how did you get your nickname, one of them asked. The waitress just smiled at him. As the baby elk needed to be taken care of and watched after, my parents started calling me Little Yeti, as I took care of the calf like the hairy man looked after it. Over the years, the name just stuck. 
Her customers started laughing. Yeah, that makes sense. Thanks for sharing your story with us. No problem, she said. There's more to the story, and I have other experiences up at our family cabin, but I have to get back to work. Have a great night, and thanks for coming in for lunch. My two friends and I just sunk deeper in our booth as we looked at each other and smiled. Deep in the Blue Ridge, there's a place my husband had been warned about. You don't go in there before daylight. And don't let the sun set on your heels either, his big papa would say. These are big words from a giant of a man. Raised on Waddle Mountain, he was six foot four and 280 pounds, and he wasn't afraid of anything. Afraid of anything except the devil's elbow, that is. There's an eerie cone of silence that filled that area that no one could explain. It is a silent place, no birds, insects, or other wildlife sounds. If you were there, you would hear your own breathing and heartbeat, nothing else. That's the way it was in there all the time. Big Papa had been raised near this area in a six-log-high two-story cabin. These woods had been untouched by man until logging had become a good source of income. That was Big Papa and Uncle Ben's job logging in the very place that neither of them would venture into before daybreak or stay after dark. When Big Papa and Uncle Ben would walk down the street in nearby towns, people would step off the sidewalk and walk around them. Sheer size and reputation and rumors of why Big Papa had to leave town kept others at bay. Big Papa is gone now, but it took nine men to carry his special made casket to the grave. Ben and he were very big men, and many didn't know, but Big Papa was indeed a gentle giant, despite what everyone thought. Oh, and there is one living soul that Big Papa was afraid of, and that was his wife. This part of the story is funny to me because she was a very small woman, but was tougher than most men. She had been raised with boys and even carried her pocketbook in her back pocket like a man. She killed a catamount once and wore the claw around her neck. I wore it in my wedding as something old, you know, like something new, something old, something borrowed, and something blue. That might be a mountain thing, but we still do it around here. Once when my husband was two, Big Papa had scared him so bad after dark with a low animal type growl that my husband had tore off his big toenail scrambling up the bank to get home. When Granny found out, she got a chair and a stick of stove wood and told Big Papa to stand still while she beat his head with that wood and dared him to move. I believed she aimed to kill him for scaring her youngest grandbaby, my husband. So here I find myself explaining about the man my husband looked up to only to show you a bit of his past. His upbringing was very rough in comparison to mine, and he always tried to obey his big papa, and the story I will tell you should have been one of those times he heeded his warnings. The event takes place in 1985. Being much like his big papa, my husband loved being in the woods. He enjoyed hunting and the sound of the dogs baying a coon. So it goes that my husband had started out alone hunting in a place called the Devil's Hole. Well, alone with his two dogs, little Russell, a walker, and old Looney, who was a black and tan. This trio would hunt six nights a week for five years. Looney was a dual Grand Knight champion in coon hunting. Looney was killed by a panther some years later. This was a night my husband would never forget, and it took him years to even tell me the story. On foot, they went in the devil's hole and ended up in the very place that he was told not to go, the devil's elbow. That's where the dogs had bait a creature my husband had never seen. It was the legendary Bigfoot. He first saw the creature standing in the middle of an old forest service road. Coon hunters know their dogs in every way. 
even the sound of their barking. They always know if the dogs are on a coon or something else. But this time, they were booger barking. The dogs were nervous, but had the beast bayed in the road nonetheless. When he got to the dogs, he couldn't pull them off their stance. He searched the area with his light and couldn't find it at first, and then he saw it. Brownish black in color and at least eight foot tall and three and a half feet wide at the shoulders. What he was looking at was like nothing he had ever laid his eyes on. Other than the dogs barking, you couldn't hear anything, not even the river running, until it screamed. It was an ear-piercing sound, nothing like any sound he had ever heard. The dogs kept baying, and my husband raised his rifle and made eye contact with it. The animal grunted loudly and was gone. Nothing to see, nothing for the dogs to track. It just vanished. My husband said that he was never afraid during this encounter. I honestly think he was disappointed the hunt was over for that night. He never returned to the devil's elbow after that, though. He hunted the devil's hole, but never returned to the elbow. Now he understands why Big Papa and Uncle Ben told him to stay out of there after dark. Well, that's my husband's story, Cam. I've known something happened to him back then, but I could only get bits and pieces. He doesn't talk about it. I've tried to pull the whole story from my husband for years, and recently he laid it all out for the kids and I. And now you have it. I hope you enjoyed it and can use it for your show. Oh, and as for me, I've only heard the scream and felt the fear myself once, but that's a story for another time. A friend once told me that he really wanted to see a Bigfoot. Two years later, while headed into a neighboring town to do some shopping, we drove past a group of people stopped on the side of the highway. We weren't sure if they were all together or just random people pulled off the side of the road at the same time. It just seemed odd that so many people were gathered at the same time in the same spot. The temps were in the 70s with a clear blue sky, and if my memory serves me, it was 2 p.m. in the afternoon. We both commented on the spectacle of seeing so many people and wondered what was happening. Nevertheless, we continued driving for another several miles to a small grocery store. There, we both got what we needed, and then we headed back home. On the way home, as we approached the crowd, we pulled over. I told him that I was going to take some photos of the beaver dam that was located off to the side. Fortunately, there wasn't anyone in that area, so I was free to take my time photographing the fallen trees, flooding, and the beaver dam itself. My friend, however, walked right into the mess of people. Apparently, some were from a single family while others had just pulled over for a break and to stretch their legs. We were probably there about 10 minutes when I thought to cross the river below the beaver dam and see what was in the woods. Something or someone told me not to, so I stopped halfway across the river and I retreated back towards the vehicle. That's when I saw my friend standing next to a woman on the river bank. He was pointing into the woods on the other side of the river. I didn't bother with the walk in their direction, and I decided instead to review my photos while waiting inside the Jeep. After another five to ten minutes, he returned, and we headed home. Three years later, he was visiting family in Florida, and I was still in my small mountain town. He called, and he said, there's something I need to tell you. His words seemed strange, as he has never said that before. I wondered what was to follow. Remember that day we pulled off to see what everyone was doing, he asked. Yeah, I replied. Well, while you were taking pictures of that beaver dam, I walked along the riverbank while looking down into the river for potential fishing holes. You remember that? Yeah, I remember, I replied. At one point, I looked up across the river into the woods, and I think I saw a Bigfoot. I was now shocked, and I said, what? It was standing behind a tree and moving or swaying its upper body from side to side while it watched me. When I realized that it was staring at me and we made eye contact, I pulled my head down and looked away and I said to myself, Oh, shit. Wait, that was three years ago and you're just now telling me this? I exclaimed. 
uh, yeah, I didn't know what to say at the time. And then I asked, well, what else happened? And he continued. After looking away for a moment, I lifted my head and I looked back towards the creature. It had moved in just a brief second or two to my right, say 50 feet or more, and was shaking another tree. That tree looked to be 12 to 14 inches in diameter. The whole tree was swaying as it rocked it with just its arms. What do you mean, its arms? It grabbed the tree and it shook it, you know, without using its entire body to force the tree to move. There was also a woman nearby that I called over to see if she could see it too. And I replied, right, I remember seeing her beside you as you pointed into the woods. Yeah, that's when I asked her if she saw it. Well, what did she say, I asked. Well, she just stood there for a moment and then asked me if that was my friend. Evidently, she saw us pull up and exit the Jeep, so she had seen you. He continued, After I answered that you weren't nine feet tall and all black, she paused for a second while trying to comprehend what we were seeing, and she finally asked, Is that a Bigfoot? And then he turned towards her and said that he didn't know. When they looked back across the river, the creature was gone. And as I stood there astonished, I said, I cannot believe you didn't tell me about this for three years, especially after saying you wanted to see one. Yeah, I know. I needed time, I guess, to think about what I had really seen and if it was really a Sasquatch, he replied. That's the end of his encounter, but I'd like to add something to his overall experience, Cam. Whenever he was in town visiting the three years since having this experience and before telling me about it, he would crash at my place. Before going to bed each night, I would download several Bigfoot encounter stories from different YouTube channels and set them to play on my computer in the living room. Some of them were over an hour long, and he'd listen to them while crashed out on the couch. I can't say how many hours in all he consumed of other people's Bigfoot encounter stories, but I think they all helped him cope with the trauma of what shocked his beliefs on that day. Even after he returned to Florida, he continued to listen to people's stories, and that gave him the courage and confidence to finally tell me what he had experienced that day. Though it was a non-threatening experience, it still shook him to his core and challenged his beliefs. In the days, weeks, and months that followed, he searched his memories of any other times that he may have experienced Bigfoot activity, namely while deer hunting on his family farm in Indiana. This was prompted by many of the Bigfoot show call-ins he listened to by fellow hunters. For example, he recalls a time that he heard what he always thought was a smack on the water by a beaver's tail, but he now wonders if it was a tree knock or a smack on a tree from a Sasquatch. His mind told him it was probably just a beaver, even though he knew they didn't have beaver there. And then there's that tree that fell close to him while he was perched silently in his tree stand listening for deer. He said it was so loud and close and it sounded like a huge tree crashing to the ground. It really startled him because he didn't hear anyone else out there with him and it was so sudden. When he was done hunting for the day, he climbed down the tree and went in search of the tree. To this day, he's never found it and that's confused him. Hearing other people call into Bigfoot podcasts and YouTube shows to detail their strange run-ins with Bigfoot or Dogman has helped to make sense of many memories he's had over the years while hunting. I was considering my strange story and seriously thought that I might not send it. It doesn't have the desired Bigfoot sightings that many of your listeners crave. However, the story is one that is tied to Bigfoot or along that vein. Since I've heard many stories of Bigfoot's vocalizations that are amazing and varied, I came to the conclusion that this might have been the source of my confrontation occurring in the East Bay Regional Park of Oakland, California in the mid-1990s. I'm sending this to make people aware that when hiking alone, there are strange, frightening things that reside in the wilderness areas. When alone in the wilderness, anything can happen. 
On a sweltering hot July day in Oakland, California, it was partly cloudy and I was home with my wonderful son and my bride, Gina. I'm an avid hiker, and during this time, I was struck by a strong desire to explore the gorgeous East Bay's Redwood Park. This beautiful park is off Skyline Boulevard and Redwood Road in Oakland, California. It is one of the most beautiful and well-run parks in the nation, in my opinion. So I had to get out of the house and stroll the trails passing the horse stables, which allow many to ride horseback throughout the park's myriad of trails. There are services not related to the park district, which offer guided tours through the park's trails and golden landscapes. Oaks and eucalyptus fill the serpentine strata of geologic formations, forming from past volcanic activity. There are vast open areas of amber grasses, stone outcroppings, along with beautiful vistas surrounding you on every side. It is worth visiting East Bay Regional Parks, exploring, or to bring the family for a wonderful picnic with the beauty of nature, solitude, communing with the wildlife, even parrots are part of the wildlife. Plus, you might meet the wonderful folk who live adjacent to the park or live nearby. Children would love it, of course, but watch them closely. Venomous snakes, badgers, coyotes, and other unseen dangers can be deadly. Could it be there are spirits wanting to elicit fear so it will create confusion, causing people to make drastic mistakes in judgment while suspending the rational mind? This would naturally lead some inescapable consequences. I almost didn't make it back from my hike. When I couldn't resist the wanderlust within my soul any longer, I asked my wife if she wanted to join me on an adventure. I had the day off and the weather was wonderful. For her, it may have been rather hot for the jaunt of about three to four hours, even if we had a small picnic, so she declined. I sought her permission to strike out alone. She agreed to this as long as I was careful, and back by dusk or before the evening crept into darkness. I gathered my bottled water, food, and my favorite power bars to carry in my pack, and then I grabbed my manzanita staff along with a dark green wool cloak with a wide hood for protection from the sun. Believe it or not, the wool cloak blocked the sun and actually kept me cool, preventing heat stroke or exhaustion. I like preparing well for hikes since you never know what may happen. I did not plan on going off trail or into areas of arduous physical exertion, so I thought I would be fine without my first aid kit. I knew the trails very well. I had hiked them for years before this day of unexpected adventure, trial, and fear. I will never forget this day since all that happened was beyond extraordinary. I started off with a quick pace on MacArthur Boulevard and I walked to the intersection of Redwood Road. I turned right, starting my 30-minute trek to Skyline Boulevard, where the beautiful Oakland Hills homes are nestled in their secluded hideaways. I began the walk to the ranger station on Skyline Boulevard, reaching the area where they have a water fountain with benches for resting after hikes. I reached the trailhead at 3.30 p.m. I then decided to head straight to a shade tree that I loved. The branches on this tree hung to the ground around the whole tree and it gave a pleasant cooling shade, allowing me to avoid the grilling heat on those brilliantly sunny days. I hit the Graham Trail to the intersection of Dunn and was excited about the hike ahead going along the shaded equestrian trail while relishing the thought of the sights that I would see. On previous hikes, I've seen wildlife frolicking under a full moon, unequaled in beauty compared to anything I have ever seen. Now, as I made my way to the connecting trail leading to my tree, which I considered a special place, I enjoyed taking the hike slowly while investigating the sounds, or stopping to look at different plants, insects, or just to admire the views that stretch all the way to Mount Diablo. 
I was in my glorious heaven. I arrived at my tree and climbed into the thick branches while thinking about my life and troubles. I pulled out my snacks and an ice-cold Dr. Pepper. After a long time of relaxation, I was beginning to think that it was now time to head back to the house and eat dinner my wife was busy preparing. I gathered up my pack with my Manzanita walking stick, starting the trek back home. It was calm, little to no wind, and not a soul in sight. I could hear what I believed to be small squirrels scurrying in the brush that surrounded the trail as I was trekking back home. It had been a wonderfully peaceful day on the trails exploring, and I was getting close to the fork in the trail where I would turn to go to the ranger station on Skyline Boulevard. As I neared the point of my turn, the wind began gusting, creating dust clouds while cutting into the brush, trees, and plants along the trail. It temporarily blinded me with dust as the wind chilled with mists of an approaching rainburst. I decided to stop and thought of finding cover in case of a heavy rain. However, the rain burst didn't happen as I thought it would, so I continued on to the left heading back towards Skyline Boulevard. I had gone along the trail to a point where a lone power line was strung across the trail. I had walked along the trail to a point where a lone power line was strung across the trail, drooping not very far above my head. As I was approaching the turn to move lower into a small valley, it happened. There was a loud, crackling laughter around me in every direction, almost like an echo chamber reverberating endlessly. It sounded evil and mirthful at the same time. I immediately thought someone was playing a joke, and I yelled out, All right, who's doing this? It's time to stop it right now. I thought about this for a moment, and I looked around, and there was no one who could be doing this without sound equipment, yet there was no sign or indication of anyone. And as suddenly as it had begun, the laughter stopped. It was now total silence. After 10 seconds, the wind went into powerful swirling gusts as I was standing there, and I was dumbfounded. I heard something behind me and turned around, finding a wall of thick fog before me. I stared into that fog, and I heard a deep guttural sound, almost as if it was chuckling. I was upset, and I was going to walk into the fog and find out what was in there. Instantly, in my mind, the words came to me, No, turn around and leave. It's time to leave. So I turned around and and my mind went completely blank, filled with confusion. Where am I? Where do I go? Which is the way out? I don't know. I had been at this hiking area and over every inch of the trails, including every side trail. Now, here I was totally lost with no mind as to how to proceed. I walked in a direction, but I was unsure where it led. I just went tree to tree as rain started to gently fall. It was now getting cold and having no idea where I was or worse, where I was going. I was surprisingly lost in an area that I knew like the back of my hand. I went along hoping to find something familiar, but the fog, the wind, and all the swirling, silvery, shimmering mists made everything look strange and ominous. I thought, I should know how to get home, but right now there's no way to know if I'm even going in the right direction. I was now terrified, fearing that I would not come out alive while thinking no one will know what happened, and with the possibility they may never find me. Have I passed through some portal? Will I be wandering like this forever? I determined to find the way out no matter how long it took. I was wandering in every direction over the next eight hours, bouncing tree to tree and looking for the lichen on them to help with the direction which would lead me out of this forest of fear and darkness that this formerly joyous forest had become for me. But it was to no avail. Then the darkness came and my hope of finding my way out gave in to despairing hopelessness. Thinking the worst, I began imagining that I was doomed. This is how I will die. 
I started to tremble while slowly looking around and wondering which way to go. I had no clue and no way seemed sure as it was now pitch black. I heard strange sounds and crackling branches. What was it? I imagined horrible creatures as I heard sounds coming near and then sounding far away, and then shifting branches and the sound of footfalls coming towards me. Terror had me panicking to the point of inability to move, act, or think. I decided to keep moving, but afraid of what I might run into, or even more frightening thought, will something unnatural and evil find me? Things were at their very worst, And then, out of the midst of the dark swirls of mercury mists, a hay bale with a target on it. Oh joy, I was now on the archer's range and would be close to the road. I had to get to the archer's stand and figure out which direction the road of my deliverance was located. I wandered around, guessing it was about an hour, and I finally reached the archery registration office. I then wound my way around, finding the trail to the road, then deciding to take a shortcut through the brush. I saw a light, and three workers were under the light smoking pot. With my hood over my head and tightly wrapped up, I emerged from the dark woods and brush with my tall walking stick. The men froze as I said hello, and I was so relieved to find humanity and safety. I was out of the woods and on my way home. I walked up to the men, and they were as statues looking behind me, and they seemed as if they were frozen in time, like a museum setting. The burning pot was touching the man's finger, and he did not move or flinch or even blink. Not one of them moved or stopped to even notice me. They were frozen and looking behind me with a look of wide-eyed terror. I was going to look behind me, but I decided that that was not the thing to do, and I kept walking. I moved quickly to the next light at the intersection about 50 feet down the road, and I turned right wondering what was wrong with those men. What had they seen, and why did they not acknowledge or notice me or even ask if I needed help? I was moving as quickly as I could. I heard the restless branches and brush being jostled close by as I went to the middle of the well-lit road, and then I started slapping my walking stick on the pavement. Why? Because I was terrified, and this gave me some sense of security. It took another 30 minutes to reach the ranger station, and hopefully safety. At that point, the noises ceased, and silence was once again surrounding me like a blanket. I walked to Skyline and then made my way to Redwood Road and went swiftly to MacArthur Boulevard that brought me two blocks from home. I walked in the door and my wife Gina greeted me and asked if I was okay and I mumbled, I'm fine. And I went to my room tossing my clothes to take a needed shower. I was savoring these moments and glad to be home secure, safe and with my family. I was thankful to escape whatever was in those woods. I knew I would go hiking there again, though. Would whatever was there stalking me be waiting for me next time? I didn't know. But when I did go back, I was careful in thinking that I wouldn't hike at night again. Of course, I ended up hiking at night many times after. The first time was fearful, but I overcame it. After that time, these events never happened again. Since then, I believe something is up in the East Bay Regional Redwood Park. I couldn't tell anyone outside of close family and friends since it sounds like a crazy story of an unhinged person. Yet it really did happen, and I'm glad I survived it. At the time of this hike, I thought my life was over. However, my father above kept me safe, even as I was terrified at wit's end with no hope. Thanks to him, I'm here today. In 1984, we were at Camp Geronimo, a scout camp near Paisan, Arizona. 
It was two weeks of having fun while working on marriage badge requirements in the lush woods of the Mogollon Rim. Y'all like how I said that? That's probably the word that I have been most corrected on. It's it's not Mogollon, it's Mogion. So I hope I got that right and I hope everybody's happy. One evening, our scoutmaster informed a few of the other boys and myself that we had to get our sleeping bags, hike out a couple of miles, and spend the night on the side of the mountain for a merit badge requirement. We took a trail that ran along the stream. It took us deeper and deeper into the mountains. Along the way, we saw tree stumps that were twisted off about waist high. This seemed odd because we couldn't imagine what would have the strength to do something like that or why. It also looked like it was freshly done. Our scoutmaster warned us about bears in the area, and he wanted us to be careful. I know that bears mark trees with their claws, but there wasn't any evidence of that at all. Even so, we dismissed it as something a bear had done. We reached the area where we were to set up camp for the night, and my scoutmaster went searching for kindling to start a fire. There was a foul smell in the air. It smelled like a combination of dead fish and skunk. While our scoutmaster was picking up sticks, someone kept lobbing large rocks in his direction. Every time he turned around, a rock would hit the ground near him. He told us to knock it off. He was not happy about it at all. None of us were throwing rocks, though. Before we went to bed, we got a decent-sized fire going, and we all sat around the fire to get dry in order to prevent hypothermia. Later, we crawled in our sleeping bags, and my buddy next to me had some corn nuts that he had stolen from another scout's pack. We laid there crunching on those for a while, and we eventually dozed off. When I went to sleep, there were no trees within several feet of me. But when I woke up in the middle of the night, there were what I assumed were two trees above my head just inches away. I figured that I had rolled in my sleeping bag since we were on an uneven area. Something told me to close my eyes and go back to sleep, and that's exactly what I did. When I woke up in the morning, I discovered that I hadn't rolled in my sleeping bag at all, and the two trees that were above my head were gone. We all saw what looked like a set of tracks that went from behind our campsite and led to exactly where I was sleeping. They then went to my right and through the middle of our camp and out towards the trail that was next to the stream. At the time, I knew nothing of Bigfoot, so we all assumed that it must have been a bear. But if it were a bear, it would have gone looking for that open bag of corn nuts that my friend had in his sleeping bag instead of hovering over the top of me. After hearing of other people's stories of Bigfoot, I was curious to see if there has been sightings of them in the Mogion Rim. Mogion. I looked it up, and to my surprise, there have been several. There's even a name for the creature. It's referred to as the Mogion Monster. This really came as a surprise to me because I thought that Bigfoot sightings only happened in places like Washington State. I would have never guessed that there would be any in Arizona. So I would like to tell you about an all too close encounter with a Bigfoot in Oklahoma. I still remember that night like it was yesterday. The summer of 1979, I was 11 years old. My mother had recently married a man who lived in Oklahoma. He had five kids, but none of them lived with us. His two youngest sons, Jesse, 17, and Dale, 19, would come stay with us a weekend or two every month. One night while they were there, Jesse and Dale and their girlfriend showed up to see their dad, but he and my mother had gone out and they wouldn't be home until the next day. That Friday night, they wanted to go build a bonfire at a gravel pit just over the hill from where we lived. They took my brother and I along with them. We got to the gravel pit, they built a fire, and they were drinking and smoking pot. My brother and I were too young for that, so we sat off by ourselves while they did their thing. We actually had a good time. We all finally gathered around the fire, and it was fun watching the older kids laugh and talk. 
and other than the drinking, we felt included. The night was going good, and Jesse looked past me, and he pointed to a tree behind me. He said that he could see an owl perched there. We all turned to look, and there, about seven or eight feet up the tree, were a pair of orange eyes, and they were blinking. There was a weird sound coming from that spot. It sounded like a growl, but it was faint. We paid no attention to it. I don't know if the others could hear it, but I heard it, and I would never have remembered that growl had the night not later erupted into chaos. We looked and we talked about how cool it was to see an owl this close. And then we discovered that it was not an owl. The eyes started to move, and those eyes belonged to a creature much larger than an owl. It was a giant, man-like creature covered in hair. Immediately, they all jumped up and they ran to the car. They got in and sped away, leaving me in the dirt yelling for them to stop. And I stood there in the dust watching the taillights fade into blackness. I turned back to see where the hairy creature was and he was in the open now walking towards me. I was terrified and I started to run. The gravel pit is only a quarter of a mile from our house through the woods and that is the direction I started running. I was crying and hyperventilating and not sure if the creature was chasing me but I just ran. I ran for my life. Any minute I expected the beast to grab me from behind and kill me, I knew I was a dead kid. After running a long way, I approached a barbed wire fence. This was the only obstacle between me and the house. If I could make it to that fence, I felt like I had a chance. The house was only 150 yards further. I turned on the speed. The fence was too tall for me to jump, so I had to stop and climb over it. When I did, I looked back reluctantly, and the beast was trotting or sort of jogging at me just a few feet away. My shorts hung in the fence, and I fell forward, tearing my shorts and cutting a long gash in my leg. I didn't even feel it at the time, but from the ground, I glanced back quickly, and the monster was almost to the fence. I launched myself off the ground, put my head down, and sprinted through the woods towards the house. I could finally see the porch light now and also the headlights on Dale's car. I broke the tree line into the expanse of an open field and I ran until I was almost to the house. I looked back and the creature was in the field still running at me. I made it to the front porch and twisted the doorknob, but it was locked. I beat on that door like my fists were a framing hammer. I could hear the others in the house and I beat the door even harder. Finally, the door flew open and I fell inside crying in hysterics. I turned to look at the others and they were at the living room window pointing at the monster that was now in the yard. At the time, we had a vicious German shepherd chained up in the backyard and I recall him barking nonstop throughout this ordeal. In my mind, I could see the dog at the end of its chain trying to break loose to get to this creature. Jesse ran to his father's bedroom and got the shotgun. Something hit the side of the house. The dishes in the kitchen sink rattled from the other side. This thing had shaken the whole mobile home on its foundation. The girls were screaming and Jesse was shouting that he was going to shoot this thing if it didn't leave, like it was going to understand what he was saying. And everything got quiet outside. We thought maybe the thing had left. Another crash on the side of the trailer proved us wrong. Pictures and wall hangings began to fall to the floor. It was working its way down the side of the house. We all stood in the middle of that living area with our heads following the noises as the creature banged its way to the end of the house. And then metal began crunching at the end of the house where a bedroom had been added. Lots of noise and then a loud roar. That's when we knew it had broken inside. The whole house was shaking and it felt like the house would collapse around us. The banging and the noise finally stopped as suddenly as it had started. I could hear the dog barking like crazy still in the yard held back by its chain. But within a minute or so, the barking stopped and all was quiet. None of us made a sound. We just listened. 
Minutes passed, and it looked like the night of terror was over. Not long after, almost everyone was asleep on the living room floor. Jesse stayed up the rest of the night gripping that shotgun. The next sound I remember was a car pulling into the driveway. I opened my eyes, and it was daylight. I wiped the sleep from my eyes, wondering if the whole thing could have been a nightmare, until I looked over and I saw Jesse standing at the window, looking out with the gun in his hands. All of us ran out to greet our parents, and we frantically told them the story, all of us at once. They had to calm us a bit and ask us to speak one at a time. When my stepfather got the picture in his mind, we all walked around the house looking at the damage. There were large dents in the walls every three or four feet. At the end of the house where we heard the loudest noises, the add-on bedroom looked as if it had been lifted off its foundation. That was the metal that we heard crunching and breaking. That beast had lifted the whole addition and moved it several inches to one side. In the dirt were several tracks of a normal-looking bare foot, only it was three times the size of a normal human. Later that day, I remember my stepfather walking around the house taking pictures of everything that we saw, all the damage and the tracks the creature had left behind. I also remember a neighbor who came to the house that day. This was a man who lived on the other side of the gravel pit. He kept cows on his place. He and my stepfather stood in the yard talking for a long time, and they walked around the house while my stepfather showed him the damage. The man then told him that he had lost a calf that night. He had found it in the pasture, and half of the carcass was missing. It had been torn in half. The man finally left. That day ended, and slowly, over the next few weeks, we had the house repaired, and life began to get back to normal. A few years later, before I left home, my mother divorced that man, and we moved away. I lost touch with him, and I don't know what he did with the pictures that he took. I doubt that I run into him again, so who knows what he did with the pictures. It is an event that happened when I was just a kid, but my memory of the events is clear. How could I forget that night? I never knew what that thing was until I was watching a television show about a Bigfoot in Oklahoma. Then I knew what we had encountered. I think we were attacked by a Bigfoot that was moving through the area. We never had any activity like this the rest of the years that I lived there. story about one place you mentioned in a video. I was an adult scout leader with a local troop. We did a camp out at Camp Geronimo, Arizona on the Mogollon Rim near Payson about 30 years ago. Look, I got both of those right. Mogollon, Payson. So nobody has to correct me. I don't know how you get Mogollon out of M-O-G-O-L-L-O-N. But there you have it, Mogion. Okay, I digress. To get to this camp, you have to travel off the pavement 15 miles on a rocky road that looks like a dry creek bed. It is slow going and very bumpy, and you have to be careful not to blow a tire. Once at the camp, you're miles outside of town, and the nights are pitch black, but the stars are magnificent. The camp is overlooked by a high thousand feet foot cliff called the Mogollon Rim. It is absolutely a beautiful wilderness. One night a week there was a campfire where the story of the Mogollon monster would be told by a camp staff member who was also a local high school drama teacher. So you know it was good when he told it. And the kids were pretty shaken up after hearing it. 12-year-old kids are impressionable, and they are apt to believe ghost or monster stories. Right after the story was finished, and it was dark out, I was scheduled to take the kids on a night hike of the Cat Eye Trail. The Cat Eye Trail is a trail where you have to find different markers at night around the woods using a compass. I had a piece of paper as a guide, and it provided compass bearings. 
we were to find the markers one at a time. The markers are bike reflectors placed in trees, and when the light reflects back to you, they look like monster eyes, especially if you've just heard a monster story by the campfire. After listening to the monster story, the scouts were a little apprehensive about seeing two eyes reflecting in the trees, even though they knew they were plastic reflectors. I was in the Army at the time and very good with orienteering with a compass, so I made sure that the kids found the markers so that they would not get lost in the dark woods. Oh, it was pitch black. There was no moon out, no city lights, and it was very quiet. It felt like we were in the blackness of the dark side of the moon. However, the kids were doing well in finding the markers. We had traversed the trail for about an hour with only three reflectors left to find, and the scouts were eager to get back to camp where ice cream was waiting. We would soon be done. We got to the bottom of a hill, and I told the scouts that according to the coordinates, the next reflector was 200 yards on up this hill. The kids left me behind as they bolted up the hill. When the kids charged up the hill and reached the top, they were not alone. They ran into a javelina, which is an animal like the wild boar and about the same size. It has hair like a rabbit all over it, and the scouts had found their monster. By the time I caught up to them on the hilltop, the javelina was gone. I didn't see the animal, but I knew what it was from their initial description. But as they recounted the sighting, the creature gained in size with each telling until it was almost six feet tall, maybe taller. Before the incident, the kids were bouncing all over the woods and it was hard to keep track of them. After they saw the creature, all of the kids grabbed onto my shirt sleeves and they refused to let go. We finished up the trail finding the last few markers with the kids hanging on tightly. It was no comfort to the kids because I was laughing the whole time. I also did not reassure them because I had told them that I had been camping almost every weekend since I was four years old. And after 25 years, nothing had eaten me yet. And for some reason, that was not reassuring to them. In June of 2018, I was invited to go fishing with a friend and his son to fly in a lake out of Red Lake, Ontario. Jeff and I had been friends for over 30 years, and we both attended the police academy in a large Midwest city. We're retired now, and we decided to bring along a mutual friend named Chad, who is still a deputy sheriff. Jeff's son, Kyle, went with his father and grandfather to the same lake nine years ago. The lake has only one cabin on it, and we could portage four others. We would be the first four there in nine months. The flight out of Red Lake was 25 to 30 minutes deep into the Woodland Caribou Provincial Park. Just before we left, he dropped a bomb on me. He said nine years ago he was fishing with his father-in-law and son on the dock when a 25-pound rock flew over the cabin and splashed into the lake. Then another rock of the same size flew over and landed on some pallets, smashing them to pieces. His son Kyle backed that story up. Jeff said the distance that the rocks traveled was probably more than 75 yards. I thought he was joking, but he was dead serious. He said that he and his son waited there a while, and he and his father-in-law went to check on the other side of the cabin. When he got to the cabin, they saw an eight-foot black Sasquatch heading up the hill into the woods. I didn't know what to think. I quietly assumed that he had seen a bear and the rocks were either fish jumping or rocks falling from the hillside, and that he just imagined that it was a Sasquatch. We arrived at the lake and immediately started fishing. I was in the boat with Chad and didn't get more than 100 yards from the cabin when we heard a tree go down. Throughout the day, we heard whistles, vocals, and we even heard a howl. We both heard what I can only describe as a young girl making gibberish noises. Chad said he thought it was a baby in the woods. 
The terrain around us was steep, and there was no way to investigate these noises, so we just kept fishing. After we heard the vocals, a rock the size of a golf ball struck our boat. We were about 50 yards from the bank. I could see the other boat a quarter mile away, so I knew it was not the other guys pulling a prank on us. We were in the middle of nowhere with only four people and two boats. There was not another person for miles. Around sundown, Chad came into the cabin and said that he heard a loud crash in the woods. Before we went to sleep, I had to set up my CPAP machine, but power supply to the battery was wrong. So we had to put a generator on top of an old refrigerator, and then we ran it through my window. It was noisy, and I put in some earplugs so that I could sleep. Five minutes later, I heard the loudest knock I've heard in my life across the cove, and then five seconds later, another one, but on the cabin side of the cove. The knocks were so loud that I could hear it over the generator running and despite my earplugs. The sound was very similar to a professional bowler throwing a strike in a tournament. That initial impact with the pins is always loud and distinct. I actually felt the strike through the window, which was partially open. The next day, I put all of my 275 pounds into a tree knock and I could not come close to the volume that I heard the night before. The rest of the second day was uneventful. Sunday, we heard unusual whistles and a howl. That night, around 2.30 a.m., I heard a loud crash, and the whole cabin shook. This is a huge cabin, and it felt like a car had run into it. As I scrambled out of the bed, there was another big bang, and the whole cabin shook again. I came out of the room, and all three of the others were still in their beds, but they were wide awake. The next morning, I was the first to the outhouse, and I found a six-foot fence post laying almost in the outhouse. This post was straight and heavy. It looked like a railroad tie with a narrowed or pointed end, about the same size and length. I was convinced there was either a Bigfoot messing with us or some locals who might be homesteading in the woods and didn't want us around. Tuesday was our last night there, and again, around 2.30 a.m., I woke and went out to the living room area. Jeff was sitting on the couch. He said something was throwing rocks at the cabin. I stood there in silence, and sure enough, a rock hit the cabin. All of us were inside at the time. I heard movement and a weird vocalization, so I armed myself with a bowie knife and a spear I made the day I found the post in the outhouse, and I reluctantly went outside and looked around, but I didn't see anything. The next day, I found what could have been a footprint or something scraped in the hard, compact dirt and pine needles. No discernible toes, though. We had planned to go back in five years, but now I'm hooked and I want to go back as soon as possible with recorders and trail cameras. And when Jeff asked the pilot, who is the owner of the cabin, about Bigfoot around the cabin, he turned pale as a ghost and he said he didn't know anything about it. He sold that outpost that year. He had owned the place since the early 1960s. Maybe he didn't want the liability. I hope he sold it to someone who will keep it open for fishermen to rent. If I can arrange it, I'm going to go back, and I'm not a skeptic anymore. So I've got a story from 1965 when I was 10 years old. We lived in Houston, Texas. We lived in a sprawling suburbia with all the conveniences that you could ask for. My mom grew up in East Texas, though, so every two weeks we would go visit my grandmother, Minnie Mama, in the piney woods near the Davy Crockett National Forest. She lived in a two-room house that started out as a log cabin. The living room had two beds in it, a fireplace, three rockers, and a bench. The back room also had two beds. She had an outhouse that no one ever wanted to use because of the dirt daubers flying around and the thought of a snake down in that potty. My grandfather died when my mother was six years old, and Minnie Mama never remarried, and she lived there all alone. 
She kept the farm going with the help of her six kids. And I'm telling you this to say that she was tough and nothing ever scared her. Mom and dad and us three kids were there for a weekend. We had a bath in the number three wash tub right outside the kitchen door, and we put on our pajamas. Mom took me and my sister in one of the beds in the front room, and my grandmother was in the other bed. Mom and dad were in the back room along with my brother. We turned off the lanterns, and if you've ever been in the deep woods at night, it gets very dark out there. I remember always playing the game to see if I could see my hand coming at me in the dark, and I couldn't. It was that black. But all was well, and everything was comfortable, and everybody was sleeping. In the middle of the night, we were all awakened by a horrible scream outside. Dad got up, but the rest of us, except for many mama, covered our faces, scared out of our minds. Within a second or two, another screech came from the back of the house. Dad already had the shotgun loaded and was standing in the middle of the front room when the screech came from the side of the house. The scream was so loud and unreal that it was like nothing I've ever heard or have heard since. And how did it get from the side back to the side of the house and to the back of the house so fast with no noise at all? My dad stepped out onto the front porch and he looked around and then he fired two warning shots. He must have been terrified, but he didn't show it. We didn't hear any more screams that night, but it took a lot of coaxing to get us kids back to sleep. I think the adults stayed awake a while too. The next day, our dad sent all of us to stay at my aunt's house in town, and he and my uncle came back and hung a slab of meat on the fence, trying to coax the animal back. They waited for a scream or the appearance of this creature, but they never heard or saw anything all night. My dad wanted my grandmother to stay at my uncle's house, but she refused, saying that she had a good old dog to watch out for her. I don't recall where that good old dog was the night before, probably under the bed. Minnie Mama lived another 20 years staying in that house off and on and was never frightened at all. She said that she had God to look after her. She finally got an indoor bathroom and life was good. And that scream was never heard again. Was it a Bigfoot or what? I don't know if we'll ever know. Thanks for reading my story and every word is true. My name is Bob and I'm 79 years old and experienced something with my brother by my side, which we collectively never forgot. I was 11 years old in the summer of 1951. We had recently moved to Lake Charles, Louisiana. Our dad was assigned to a small naval group there as their supply officer. We were cut from the cloth of the 1950s. Get out and play and don't come home until dark 30. My brother and I lived wild and free, or at least as far as our minds and muscles would take us. My brother was the true wild one without a fear in the world in his 14-month older body. Me, on the other hand, I was prone to, how about let's think this over, what do you say? He would have none of that and would subsequently drag me along as a scapegoat, if you will. That was, if his plans went awry, it was always Bob's idea. Lake Charles was surrounded by swamp of varying density and darkness. My brother and I found the remnants of a narrow-gauge railroad track the week before and were hell-bent for leather to follow it. We knew it was not in use due to the rust on the rails and the poor condition of the trestles. With our sack lunches tucked securely in our belts and our daisy Red Rider BB guns, we loaded up and we began our adventure. The only warning we received from well-meaning older people was to mind the gators. Well, now that was an expression that went right over our heads because we couldn't think of anything an alligator could tell us which we would have to obey. We barely minded our parents. Following the tracks and then the trestle and then back on the tracks, we managed to go deeper and deeper into the swamp. Occasionally, we would shoot at water moccasins swimming away from us. And the further we went, the more we wondered. 
Who would run a railroad through such precarious trestles, and to what end? We would soon have our answer. The tracks took a turn towards what we knew to be south and came upon an earthen berm. Nestled next to the berm were the remnants of what we were to be later told was an old rice mill. All the brick and cement walls were still standing, forming a large square enclosure. The floor was covered in brackish water, and there were snakes plenty to shoot at, and that we did with much gusto. In one corner of the pool erupted in a violent frenzy which took two years off my life and literally turned me all the way back to nine. It didn't take more than that to convince me that we did not belong in here. My brother was of the opinion that he was going to kill this thing. It was over 10 foot long and he said we could drag it back to the house and stuff it. Need I remind you, Daisy does not make a high-powered BB gun. We figured out how it became trapped within this enclosure because there was a portion of the wall that had come down, allowing this alligator to slip in during a high water tide event, and then it couldn't find its way out. That was the least of our concerns because the gator sank to eye level and all the water around it began to vibrate from a deep-throated sound that it was making. We were inside our little amphitheater and the sounds were very loud. Our limited knowledge of this creature left us amazed. We had no idea it was calling for reinforcements. Other gators were coming to the sound. It was during this commotion that we heard in the distance another terrifying sound. A primal roar echoed through those swamps, and it was not another gator. There were crashing and splashing sounds coming towards the mill. So with our collective valor and a silent vote, we hauled our butts back the way that we had come. On our sensible retreat, we heard a commotion, better described as a fight. Whatever had roared at us or the gator had arrived and a violent fight ensued. We didn't see this beast arrive to the fight, but we heard it and that was enough. We had never heard anything like it in our lives and it was haunting. The following weekend, we gathered the courage to go back and see what happened in that pit. We were very apprehensive about going back, but youth has no shortage of stupid. The arena was in shambles. Mud and blood was easily eight foot up all the walls. There were tufts of reddish brown hair caught on places in the wall where it was rough. The head of the alligator was in a corner of the room where it was shallow and it looked like something with unbelievable strength had grabbed the upper and lower jaws, one in each hand, and literally ripped its mouth completely apart. That would not have killed the gator, but it sure made it impotent as a killing machine. The neck appeared to have been separated by a series of bites, followed by a tearing and a rendering of the alligator's body. Again, the reptile was every bit of 10 feet long, of course, that included the two-and-a-half to three-foot disjointed, bodiless head. The rest of it was gone. That had to be at least 400 pounds of meat and bone, and it was just gone. Needless to say, we never went back into the swamps that far again. We mentioned in passing just a little of what we experienced with our young friend Ralph Thibodeau, whose family lived on a genuine houseboat on the Kalsasu River, Ralph casually mentioned there was a swamp man-like creature back in there, and we best not do that again. Thank you for letting me get this off my mind. I have never told a soul of this event. My brother has told everyone who would listen. Of course, in Lake Charles, he was preaching it to the choir. The rest of the world didn't even listen to his nutty explanation. Thank you for listening to Volume 2 of the Best of Dixie Cryptid, and we'll see you guys on the next podcast. Thank you.